I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey usually deals with the end of life. And from the beginning to the end of life. But today, we're going to take a detour. We're not going to talk about the end of life. We're going to talk about what is here and now. And my guest is Ken Farm, who's a dear, dear friend, and all of you know, I only talk to dear friends. So, Ken was, is uh, the interim chair of neighborhood board, of one of the na many yes, neighborhood boards. Lot. Which one is it? Number 15. Number 15. Uh, Kalihi Palama. Kalihi Palama. And so Ken was telling me this interesting story. He was waiting on the bus on Hotel Street and recognized the lighting. Needless to say, I have not been on Hotel Street at night for a long time. So, but I thought that was something that we, ha we should talk about. Mm -hmm. It should, not just the two of us, but the city council and everybody, because lighting at night is so important. So, Ken? So thank you very much, Marsha, for letting me be over here and on your show. Um, yes, yeah, so when we, I was just taking a bus back home. I take public uh, transportation or I'm walking, taking the bus if it's later at night. Um, and I noticed something that I really didn't take a notice before was how bright the lights are, not in a bad way, but how a person uh, might feel safer because the lights are, are much brighter. You know, I was looking up at the different types of, um, I was looking up at the, you know, the things that they're on, the, the poles, and they were the exact same poles, so I didn't think anything of it. But when looking all the way down, you could see all the way down to the other end of the street. Before, is this looking toward barely river? either way? Uh, just uh, uh, um, more uh, like Malka to Makai, and you could just see all the way to you know the, uh, where the other bus stop was. That's on King Street. Uh, much more than you could before, and I was thinking to myself, you know, that is to me, and you know, they've had concerns about safety. Um, that's something that I want to try to apply in our neighborhood board district. So I've been talking to other parts of the county council that you know for our district, uh, uh, Councilman Joy Manahan, to look at what can we do to get those lights in College Walk. So, I, so tell me what what is it that that makes these lights different from any other light? What makes them? I mean, you know, what we have currently right now are just they're they're regular lights, but they're much brighter. So you know. Most people, their most experience with it is when they're either walking or they see a driver with those LED lights, and they're much brighter. The, the, the area coverage that the light has is much so more. It, it, yes, it's, it's it much more. it comes down and out. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, even if they're just using, you know, the regular poles and just every, you know, every single one of them, it's, it brights up the area to the point where it almost feels like it's daytime. And I mean, I don't mean this in a bad way, but a person might feel more comfortable walking there because they can actually see what's in front of them uh, for the most part and actually see, you know, even dark figures or whatever it is all the way down to the other part of the bus stop. So just for me, I'm trying to work on a project where we're looking at from uh, the start of College Walk uh, coming from King Street uh, up to Kukui Street, just, just that area over there, just to kind of light it up. Uh, and as well as there's a, there's a back portion uh, from the Weinberg building and there's a credit union there. And people use that. And I, I have to be cognizant about, you know, we can't shut off every single avenue of different people using just other safety or just because people say because the homeless are there. We have to look for ways of, you know, how can they still use it but make it safer? And that was one of the things that I'm working on right there. And by continuation of that, looking at can it be done in Ivale? So, you know, when you're turning down Ivale Road, right where the Department of uh, Human Services is, I believe that building there, um, there's a place called 888 Ivale and just some of the issues that have been there, um, and the lighting there, and what can be done to increase the lighting and make it almost like what we see in Chinatown, so that there is a safer path people can see. I have a lot of older uh, individuals that live in there, and I think that it's very important that is, they feel safer. There's this big building right there, mm -hmm. beautiful building, and yes. it's for seniors, I think. Yeah, 888 Evilly. Is that what that is? That is what then it is. That definitely needs lighting. Absolutely. And uh, what about down to, all the way down, past the Goodwill and what have you? So, you know, I hate to use the term baby steps, but, you know, I'm going to see where I can do a college walk and the appropriations that we had for that. Um, also, not forgetting about Ala Park, I think that that's also very important that we have the proper lighting there, um, just so that is more of a used, you know, park. Uh, 
again, there's, you know, people wanted to kind of close the park and, and things like that. But if we can utilize the parks and people feel safe with it, um, then let's, hopefully let's we can, just we go can look park. take a step back. Mm -hmm. College Walk. College Walk. Yes. Tell us where it well. So where the new ASB, the American Savings Building is, oh, wow. right there, there's a part where um, there's a statue. I believe it's Yang Sun Set that, that would be on that area, on that side, because I believe uh, the, the uh, Chinese, Jose Rizal. Yes. The China. Keep, I, always, I think it's uh, uh, Jose Rizal. On, and the, then the other the one Filipino is. Filipino is on yes. one side, yes. and the and Chinese it, is on yes. the other side. I walk yes. past there all the time. I keep. Um, well, that used to be, you know, because on this side of the river is Chinatown, mm -hmm. and on the other side was Japantown. Mm -hmm. And that was the walk to get to what was at that time Kamehameha Schools. Oh. So that's why the name College Walk, so when everything changed, they keep College Keeping Walk. Keeping the name? Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. Um, so yeah, so that, that is very interesting. And also too, when you talk about Ala Park, um, that used to be a market a yes, long a time lot, ago. Yes. Yeah. I saw that, I was reading about that, I was like, wow, it was a fish market and other things, and then they tore it down and created it into a park. But, you know, getting back again to, to Ivalet, um, that was some of the concerns is for the residents that live there that want to go to places like Longs and Ross and some of the other, you know, types of services that are there, uh, that it's not a safe walking path. So if we can kind of accommodate that at night, I think that's very important. So what would it take to get the lights? I mean, that, that seems like common sense, but when you're talking to the bureaucracy, common sense means nothing. So what would it take to get the lights? So right now, I'm just working with some of the stakeholders in the area, like 888 Uvalade, just talking to see if that's something that they'd be willing to get behind um, as we have a neighborhood board meeting. And uh, what, you know, if, if we're going to have uh, some of the city or county officials, more mainly county, to say, hey, this is something that we really want. I think this is something that will, you know, create a more safer environment than what is currently there. As well as you know, from Ivale, Ala Park, to College Walk. But you know, my main focus was always just the College Walk our area. But if we can, you know, by extension, you know, we have in Ala Park and Ivale, then I think that we will have a much safer area for people to traverse even at night. Okay. Now I have, being an old time activist, I have a suggestion. Sure. Why not create a walk? All of these politicians, the people that write checks, the people that, that are supposed to do these things, invite them to go on a walk, A, to see what it looks like when it's dark and mm -hmm. when it, with the new lights. And then experience it. Oh, yeah. That, that's, that's simple. That way they say, oh, well, yes, of course. You know, the light bulb comes <laughs> on in their heads. I, I'm dealing with this in, in another hat that I'm wearing in a, uh, in, a com, uh, in a committee where I would, you know, we're talking about issues like pedestrian safety, but I know we're going to be in a building talking about it. Part of me is like, hey, let's just go for a go walk. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. walk. You know, Let's see take it. a look. At, yeah, yeah, I see it all the time. So I was like, I, I walk a lot. So I see a lot of things that maybe other people may not, or just in a different, you know, perspective than it's in yes. the car. You know? uh, in fact, a friend of mine, they're doing a walk in Waikiki oh. for the very same, for the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And they've invited the people, the high mucky mucks of Waikiki to go for this walk. So they can see the sidewalks. They can see what is going on. So this is not an original idea. No. But it, it works. No, it does. And that's one of the things that I like doing is I will walk. You know, I, you walk everywhere. Everywhere. I walk everywhere. But I mean, I do it. Yes, I do. It kind of keeps me thin, hopefully. <laughs> the exercise. But more or less, it's trying to get a feel for what people are talking about, right? So if you're walking in those in different areas, then you know it's different from being in a car. You can be in a car and you can drive and you can and not see anything. At, and not yeah. see anything. But if you're walking and you're you're on the ground and you're looking and you're pushing that button and you're wondering why it's taking forever or you know does <laughs> it? Um, it? It gives you a different perspective on that area. I know. I <laughs> I rode the bus today, which is not unusual. But what I had this big bag of apple bananas that my neighbor gave me off of their tree. So my intention was to get here with it. When I got off the bus on Hotel Street and all these homeless people, I just, here, take yeah. the bananas. But that walking through that gives you a different perspective than driving 
And I, and I yeah. think also when you're mentioning about the homeless, I mean, there's a, there's a part, and, and, you know, it is, it is controversial, but we have to take a more, you know, a, a research type of course and, and uh, clinical approach as opposed to just what makes people feel good. And that doesn't mean that we just pick them off. It doesn't mean we just do sweeps because, you know, first off, a sweep. They have to go someplace. Not just that. So like it, you How know, much does it cost to do a sweep? I don't really know. I haven't had a chance to take a look but at that, those costs. It, it, must, it, it, it does it cost costs. something. Yeah, it does There's cost. There's a cost. Right. So but our bigger the cost, cost of doing that, could that money be put I, in I, a better, better pot? I think it's better to look at it as some of the preventive services that are being offered right now. So, for example, the thing that's in Chinatown that's right next to the police station. Uh, and we have, actually in our area, we have one of the largest hygiene centers in the nation uh, that I helped uh, supported with that, um, along with the county council who, you know, made that happen, and I'm very appreciative of that. But, you know, though it, it seems counterproductive, you are saving money because if you have things like, for example, the medical center where people can take care of their wounds, that it doesn't get much worse than what it is. and We can treat that in a preventable way, then it's much easier to have that cost savings to deal with something else, right? right. And then the other part about it, too, is, is that we just have to also be practical with it. And, you know, when it comes to the, the hygiene center, I go what is, there. What is the hygiene center? So the hygiene center is, is a place where people who are, are homeless or just anybody, and it, if there's a homeless, you don't have to be like, am I homeless to use it, um, go there, they take a shower. Um, and, you know, I think they're up to about, I believe last time I checked, they were using it about 150, almost 100, 150 uh, people a day that use it. And honestly, if somebody is showering and having that proper hygiene, that would hopefully prevent some of the other things that occur because they're not showering and you know other right. from what I heard scabies or other things like that, which costs a lot more to deal with it on does. the back end. So you know we have to take that practical approach, but at the same time we also have to look at the big elephant in the room, which is housing, right, and proper housing, and, and that is something that is going to be coming up over and over again. Um, I bring it up to my, you know, uh, neighborhood board when it comes to housing. I try to show them, you know, this is what it means when we're using the term workforce housing. This is what it actually means. What does it mean when, you know, we're in our area. You what know, is workforce housing? So without being too technical, workforce housing, if I was to start as, as a single person right now, would be at about. I know when they it? were advertising for Kaka'ako, they kept saying it was we're workforce, workforce housing. housing. So according to uh, Housing and Urban Development, uh, that, that we use it in terms of that definition. Uh, it's between 80% AMI to 120. Well, what does that mean in real numbers? Yeah, what does that mean? So your starting out is usually they're targeting incomes of a single person, if it was a single person, at $65,000 um, and change. So 65,360 as a single person, and then from that is dictated what the, the cost is. So they're still within the realm of what's considered affordable to the federal government, but you know, like my area, our cutoff is usually about 50 thousand a year per person. Uh, sorry, not even a person, just fifty-two thousand as a family. So, you know, that's something that we have to look and take in consideration um, while we're coming up with the housing. I, I agree that we need more housing, but who's it gonna be for? We have seven thousand five hundred units that are seven thousand five hundred are gonna be built to nine thousand. Um, then we have to decide as a community who's it gonna be for. And it, for me I hope that it could be members of the community that are, are kind of growing oh, with it. Already there. And not being displaced as part of some of the things that have been. Yeah, going on that before. was getting meant to ask. As they build, do they displace people? And the displaced people, do they get Do they to get come back, back back? You know what? When it comes to just in general and, and you have two reasons, right? People who are because moving because it's of the construction, which I'm not against construction. It just like I say, what what's it for and who's it for? The other part is is um, are there gonna be so fulfilling the needs of the people who are going to be moving in there or the current uh, you know, community that's there. And I think that that's a balancing act that's going to be have happening. And the more that we have a community input, the more we can see you know, on, on the practical level as well as you know, when, what is not going to serve the needs of the community. And I think that that conversation definitely needs to happen as it, we go well, along. It, I, well, I don't know because I'm not a part of your board, but... Please come, by the way, every third Wednesday. <laughs> every third Wednesday. <laughs> every third Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Where? Uh, Union Church, right next to the Nissan. Oh, okay. But the, you know, what I'm saying is that um, do we ever have that conversation, not just in Kalihi or any other place, uh, but when they're building and displaced people, do we ever have that conversation about you are being displaced, but you can come back? Do we ever have There's that There's part of that conversation, but, you know, it, it's a real technical conversation, unfortunately. 
Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So, you know, for example, we have like uh, the Mayor Wright project, right? So, you know, they have to move everybody out and then they're going to build and then people have first refusal. But the thing is, they're finding places per the contract that, yes, you know, if, it's, if a person's living in a one bedroom, two bath, and they're trying to be close to someplace, and they have to find a, an equivalent replacement, right? But then the question lies once it's built, and, you know, we're talking about AMI, are they going to be able to, once again, come back to the area again if they wanted to? Okay, well, and we I'll, need to take a break. Okay. And we'll be back in one minute. So then talk, let's talk about Mayor Wright and what's going on or sure. what, what can happen. Okay, sure. we'll be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hi. I'm Marcia, and we're back, and we're talking to Ken Farm about all of these issues that most of us never, never, never think about, because we drive through and we don't see the lighting, and we don't pay attention to the people on the street, and it's really sad that we walk by all of these people and don't see them, don't care, and we we say aloha, but. We don't act aloha. So, but that's off the track. Now, we were talking about Mayor Wright Housing. We were. And uh, so, first, tell us where Mayor Wright Housing is. So, Mayor Wright's Housing is on the corner of on Liha Street and King. Um, you can kind of see it now. In fact, there was an article talked about it, and it was. Alluding, is that the one across from the high school? It is not across from the high school. It is across from what used to be called uh, it's the Kukui Gardens, but also an apartment. Okay. So where Pua Lane is, yes. that's part of, you know, that's kind of the, the square of, of where that is. And, you know, there's going to be a development there that's going to be several thousand units, which we do need. But the question is, who's it going to be for, right? And that comes down to... Are there to people the, in those units now? There are people in those units now that I went to a meeting where they were looking at finding replacement areas so that they can... There was talk, should, should they try to get everybody out first or should they try to be incremental in how it goes? But Either way, the, the, the other bigger point is, is once they build it up, who's it going to be for afterwards? Are they going to, after the building, will the prices be so high that these people can't that come is, back? And that is part of the question, right? And that will be depending upon, and unfortunately using the term AMI, of, of what it would be at that point. Um, you know, there was a bill that was uh, brought out. There was a bill, this was uh, HB 1312. I supported that bill, you know, in giving testimony, and I was helping out this group on the but it was also, it, it didn't really talk about that where the AMI level and requirement is. What is an AMI? So area media income is set by the federal government. It is county by county. And if you just go to Google, you can look it up. You can type in AMI Hawaii, or I'm sorry, AMI 2018 Honolulu, and that should pop up. There's a group So what the, what the medium income What of... the supposed median income is. Because I wish I knew where the... Where, where they got where, the where, 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 <laughs> because of some areas, right? Yes. So, so the federal government decided what it is. Right, and, and, through, oh, and through HUD and the funding that goes on through, you know, through whatever the packages that are dealt with on the housing side. And we know side. who is head of HUD. So, you know, and that's, and that's you know, and it's, it's an ongoing thing. But sometimes, you know, it, it's been gone for years even beyond that. But, you know, I want to make sure, because I do support mass transportation, that here's an opportunity that we have to create the housing needs that are going to be there. Yes, there are going to be more people, but then how do we make sure that we serve the current needs of the community, you know, so that they're not kicked out and then we have new people who come inside and then we have another problem with homelessness, right? That's going to be kicked down the can down the road. 
a lot of the people who are homeless, not everybody's there homeless because of just med you know, right. mental health reasons, right? Every day that the <clears throat> rent goes up, we have more people. That's right. And you know what the largest uh, uh, cohort of individuals that are, are going to start, uh, that are moving in terms of the uh, homeless and moving toward homelessness are the seniors. Yes. And, you know, that's one thing and a very sobering thought because we have a huge amount of seniors that are coming. And if we don't create the housing needs also for them as well as the medical care, um, you think that we have a problem now, think about it when it's, and, and I'm, I will guarantee you there's some of those people who never thought that that was going to be them on the street. And, well, yeah, because now last year we talked, we interviewed lots of candidates from all over the state. And amazing that the candidate from Manoa and the candidate from Windward both had the same issue, identical mm -hmm. issue, and that is seniors who have lived in this house yeah. For generations, yep. and now the property tax, That's right. and the maintenance, and they are out. Yes, and it was unbelievable that this was identical yeah. in those parts of the city that nobody pays attention to those people. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll be a little guilty of that too because you know, looking at that, it's a nuanced part of the conversation, right? Because then we think that it's going to be about just taxes or raising taxes, even property taxes, right? The, it seemed what would be not, you know hopeful is to target those who have the money right and we we're talking about seniors especially those who are retired or living here I mean the the cost of that home now was way less even if we were to adjust for inflation over the years than what it is currently you know and they just can't you know or to pay like for example I know people who live in Manoa and by the grace that their parents bought it when they did were the only ways that they could live there because even on a well, current but these, good salary the they people still afford we it. the people we were talking about are my age and older mm -hmm. who have lived in that house for right. generations but can they do the maintenance on the house can they do all of the things that a house requires and and now they're you know looking at being homeless and those are some of the questions aside from that but also people who are like, you know um, you know bring it closer to town who you know they let's say they live in Chinatown or they even live in other places like Makiki um, as prices are starting to increase even more, um, are they going to have enough, right? You know, before, like, you had people who were talking about how their Social Security, you know, not everybody had the three stools before. Was, was it pension, Social Security, and it was just savings, right? Uh, for a lot of people, it's just mostly Social Security. So if that's not enough now, imagine what it's going to be. Next week, yeah. Right, you <laughs> yeah. know? And that's what most people, you know, are worried about, that they're worried about how am I going to make sure that, you know, the rent is paid. Because once you're on the street, and this is the thing, we, you know, we, even we talk about sweeps, um, I understand the premise of it, and it does make pe people feel good, but if people are losing their documents that are essential documents, which would help in the process of getting them housing, well, people ask, okay, why, you know, why do they, they need these documentation so that it can show either they're a citizen or, or what, you know, what designation or whatever it is, uh, birth certificate, license. You'd be surprised how many offices that you can't go to if you don't have a license. So it just it seems automatic for people you know uh, that have a license or an ID that everybody should have one. Well, if, if people lose those things or they get caught up in a sweep or whatever it is, it's going to be much harder. So the way that we can help facilitate that process are things like the hygiene center, which offer those services for, for those people, and at least a place to go. I know another thing that is offered, not just there but also in, in the Wailai, is where they have a mailbox. Why is that important? Is because you need a mailing address in order to get certain services. And I, that's very essential. Yeah. I saw, um, talked to one man that went for a job. He was living in his car. Mm -hmm. He went for a job. And he gave him an address where he used to live. When they checked the address, of course, he's not there. Mm -hmm. And so then they denied him the job. So it's a catch-22. Yes, it is. Even though he was qualified, absolutely qualified for the job, but because he was no longer at the address, and he couldn't, he said he was too embarrassed to say, I'm living in my car. Right. And, then, and that's another thing, too, is, I mean, there's people who are there, you know, and, and there's another thing called the uh, assisted community treatment, which I, I do support. I think that What is needs, that? What that is, is is a bill where it's looking at where, um, People call it involuntary hospitalization. So, but it's where the person becomes a ward of the state, in effect. So if they don't 
if they're unable to care for themselves, and that's actually a very high bar to reach. But we actually do have a lot of people on the street that, that could right. meet that requirement. Um, that we're able, you know, the stem, sorry, the state, uh, and I believe by extension by the county, but mostly the state, uh, has the ability to basically be the guardian over that individual. And, you know, with that, we talked about the cost savings, which is very important. But also, it, it creates a, a safer community because if we can get those individuals off the street, um, yes, we will have a homeless problem, but at least we're trying to get people off the street. Homeless problem and on the street are, are, are not all one and the same, right? Well, now the Supreme Court issued a ruling some time ago mm -hmm. that certain people that have certain ailments that are not uh, drug, mm -hmm. that they're not drug induced, that they are born with certain kinds of issues mm -hmm. that are not what you call mentally ill, but right. they have issues that the state and the county are supposed to provide housing for those kinds of people, which we don't do. There's a lot of things that obviously need to be relooked at as well. But I also think that we need to bring in, you know, other part of the community, community partners that, you know, they advocate for those people's rights, and it's very important. But also understand that there's nuance in that conversation. It cannot just be in a one-size-fits-all type of approach for every person. Right. Just like, for example, not every person who's homeless uh, is, is crazy or have a mental problem. Sometimes it's right. because of a matter of economics and they can't find a job, or that their job was uh, is obsolete now and they don't have the skills. And even if they did have the skills, are they going to hire a person who's 45, 50 years old? Well, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> The idea that, and you're right, more and more jobs are disappearing. Mm -hmm. The types of jobs are disappearing. And so, you know, you think that you've got your life planned and your security and blah, blah, blah. And then one day something happens. There was a story on the news some time ago, and the man and his family were living in a shelter, and he had everything but the house burned down and they didn't have fire insurance mm -hmm. and lost everything. Probably so, all the documents and everything, everything else that was important. Yeah, yeah, everything. So we don't know why people find themselves in those predicaments. It's not always a, a drug issue yeah. or... I, I think that we do. I think that we put emphasis on certain things. But, you know, to the point you just made over there, sometimes people just never see that happening, right? And even though it may be a small case, I'm not saying that's every case, we have to also look at it from that standpoint too. And I think it's very important to, to, to you know, see it for what it is as a, a conversation that needs nuance. Yeah, there's one, one last thing that we see, and we see it over and over again, veterans mm -hmm. on the street. And let's assume and you know, you know more about this, med the military. Let's assume that you have a medical discharge because you jumped out of a plane and with a 100-pound thing on your back, and now you're disabled. And they let you go as a discharge, medical discharge. But your payment each month is $400. Mm -hmm. What can you do with $400? That's the issue. That is the heart of the issue. That's the, the heart of the issue why you see so many veterans on the street. Because what little bit of money they get as a medical discharge mm -hmm. doesn't do anything. Well, I think another thing that speaks to it, too, even if it's not even just include veterans, but there's a thing called permanent supportive housing, which says that we're going to house you first. We know you may have issues or whatever it is. And, you know, for somebody who's making $400, you know, I'm not saying every veteran's like this, but no, they I, may I have just, that. Sometimes we do have, you know, substance abuse or whatever it is, but the idea that they have to get clean first and then we're going to house, it doesn't work. So what permanent supportive housing says is we're going to house you and we're going to wrap those services around you and we're going to try to curtail that behavior not, you know, so that we can kind of move you forward within the process. Yeah. And, and you know, the success rate for that is much more than, than the old, ad, you know, you got to be clean first before you get in here and sober and all these other things. It's not going to work. Um, as, as has been shown. So the Seattle model is, is, is yeah. important, which we're using. Which model. Well, you know, we have run out of time. Oh. Yeah. I'm, oh, <laughs> it right? went, went so fast. Right. And there's, well, 
the issue, and the reason it went so fast is because there's so many issues out there mm -hmm. in that one little thing. So we do need to close, but promise me we're going to do a walk. We're going to walk. Okay. We'll, walk. we'll find the, whoever your city council person is, <laughs> staff, the whole thing, and do this walk. How's that? Okay? Make that happen. All right. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure visiting with you, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.